Let us pray. Love and Father who art in heaven, Lord, hallowed be thy most holy and righteous name. We want to thank you that we can meet to study thy word unmolested. Now we ask and pray that you will do for us what we can't do for ourselves, is to enlighten us, challenge us, inspire us, grant us a glimpse of the eternal world. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. The title of this evening's study is Strange, Strange Fire. You know, some time ago, I was asked to do a week of revival for a uh, junior academy in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was a little bit hesitant because they were little kids, and what can I say to them? And I was about to back out, but finally I said I'll do it for one week. And as I um, started to prepare, I came across a, a phrase, one word, and a light bulb went off in my head. And I jotted it down, did the week of revival, and came back and began to build. Fire, we're told, is a reaction involving fuel and oxygen that produces heat and light at the same time. Fire remains a potential, potentially destructive force in people's lives. Fire in the home and workplace damage property and cause injury and death. Fire usually costs the United States and Canada more each year than floods, tornadoes, and other natural disasters. According to the National Fire Protection Association, a fire broke out in a building or a structure every 61 seconds in the United States in 1998. Then the article says three quarters of all structure fires in the United States and Canada occur in people's what? Don't miss that one. Many people worry about being trapped in a hotel fire or in a fire that their schools or workplace, yet 80% of all U.S. fire, Canadian fire uh, fatalities are caused by fire in the home. The record said once a fire breaks out, it envelops a room within minutes. While the heat alone would be deadly, the toxic gas in which in the smoke causes the majority of deaths and injuries. Different fire burns at different rates. One fire may slowly smolder while another fire may quickly use up its fuel. Then the article says, the rate at which a fire burns depend, depends on the what? Of the what? The surface area of the fuel and the amount of oxygen that is available. Almost half of all fatalities from fire are due to the carbon monoxide poisoning. And more than the third are all due to cardiopulmonary complication. Then this is what the article said, which really, I chuckle at this. Extinguishing a fire involves removing one of the requirements of its combustion. Strange fire. In Revelation 13, let's go there quickly. Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 we find two beasts and we realize that beast symbolizes kingdoms. Revelation chapter 13, are we there? And verse number 1 says, And I stood where? And saw a beast what? Stop. So John said the first beast he saw came up out of the where? The sea. Now, skip over now to the second beast in Revelation 13, verse number 11. Two beasts. Now, most scholars have deduced that this beast represents the Roman Catholic Church system. Are you with me? Now, then, there's a second beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse number 11. Are we there? And the Bible says, and I beheld, are we there? Another what? Coming up out of the what? Having what? 
Like a what? And what? Stop. Did you know this is the only time in the Bible where the word lamb is applied to a uh, imagery other than Christ? Every time in the Bible when we speak about the lamb, it's usually symbolic of Jesus Christ. But here, John takes the shift from Jesus and applies it to this hideous beast. Verse 12 says, and he exercised what? All the power of the what? Before him, and he caused the earth, and what? To do what? To worship the what? Who's what? Now look at verse 13 now. And he doeth what? So he maketh what? Fire to come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Verse 14 says, And he what? Deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Those miracles he had what? In where? Saying what? They should make a what? Image to the what? Beast which had a wound by a sword and did what? They live, this beast. Now, this beast came up out of the earth. J. John Andrews, we know Andrews University is named after him. Good man. Brilliant man. I read his biography, Lord of the Flames. And I've read most of the books he has written. He has a book called The Two Horned Beast of Revelation. And did you know, well, he was so smart, they said he memorized the whole New Testament. And when our church came and they didn't know when the sun, the Sabbath, commenced, do you know who Jane and um, uh, the second president, uh, 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 James White, uh, uh, commissioned to figure out who to, rather, to find out when the, sun, uh, the Sabbath began? It was Jane Andrews. And he deduced from Scripture that the Sabbath doesn't start and end at six, but from sunset to sunset, are you with me? Sundown, are you with me? Then we attribute to him, he is the first to apply the two-horned beast of Revelation 13 to who? The United States of America. Oh, yes. Now look at his comments now. The earth. He says, out of the earth, the first beast arose out of the sea. The four beasts in Daniel 7 also arose from the sea. Since sea represents people and nations, earth may reasonably be assumed to represent a sparsely settled region. The nation thus represented would therefore not arise through war or conquest or, opposite or occupation but would develop into a greatness, into a region, few inhabitants. Have inhabitants. Are you with me? Then he says, what about these two horns? What do they symbolize? He said this in his book, well, the lamb, a Christian nation, symbolize we have Christian-like principles. Are you with me? Then he says this now, the two horns. These may be taken to represent the what? Of the what? What? Civil and what? Both which are guaranteed by the what? A civil liberty from its expression in a republican form of government and a religious by what? And Protestantism mean you what? And that name was found in the year 1529 at the protest of the princes. But as we look at verse number, verse number 13, are you with me? John said that he, this beast would make fire come down from heaven. Now, we want to find out what exactly is this fire and is it burning today in Bermuda? Now, bear in mind, the Bible is its only interpreter. So we want to find out what exactly is this fire. Now, there are several ways, approximately five ways fire is used in Scripture. Are you with me? So we want to do what we call now deductive study and see which fire can we apply to this fire with me. Now, the first way fire is used, fire was used for domestic purposes. Take notes, please. Right? Was used for domestic purposes. What do you mean? Such as baking and cooking and warmth. See Jeremiah 36, verse 22. Now, based on this context, I don't believe the fire that came out from heaven is cooking. It just doesn't fit. All right? Then the second way fire was used in Scripture, <coughs> excuse me, Fire was used for a punishment of what? Of death. Fire was inflicted on those who were guilty of certain form of unchastity or incest. You want to see Leviticus 20, verse number 14. Now, based on the context, 
I don't believe that this is the fire. But let's go on and see if we can put some sense to this thing. Are you with me? The third way fire was used, watch it now, was used in war for destruction. When Joshua took Jericho in Joshua 6.24, God told Joshua, burn everything. And only those things that could not be destroyed by fire, such as the silver and the gold, it should be brought and given back to the sanctuary. Are you with me? And uh, uh, the, the, the Baal was also burnt with torches. See Judges 17 verse 6. Now there are some who say maybe America would flex her muscle and cause a military might of fire. Maybe true, but bear in mind, the fire in Revelation 13, uh, 13 does not destroy, it deceives. Are you with me? So we can eliminate this fire. Now let's go on now. Number four, fire was used for what kind of purpose? Sacred purposes. Are you with me? Here's a text. Uh, in Genesis, sacrifice were consumed by fire. Genesis 8 verse 20. And fire obtained otherwise from the altar was called strange fire. You want to see Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2. Now we're heading somewhere now. We're heading somewhere. Are you with me? Then lastly, fifthly, 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 fire was used, watch it now, fire was used figuratively to represent, symbolize the presence of Jehovah's might and power. Let's go on. In Exodus 3, 2 and 5, Moses saw a burning bush and Jehovah's presence was in that burning bush. The fire burned, but it was not what? It was not conceived, uh, consumed, with me? In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, he descended, he, uh, the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of what? Fire, Acts 2, verse 3. Now, based on what we have just learned, could it be that the fire that John said he saw come down from heaven, could it be it would be a false presence of Jehovah? And would lead many to the brink of Armageddon. Could it be? Well, let's see. Inspiration calls Satan the arch deceiver. That's how he operates. Deception is defined as the condition or the fact of being deceived. Deception is the mingling or the commingling of enough evil with good truth and error to make it appear evil harmless and desirable. And that is why Jesus says, watch. The devil is good at telling a lie, religious lies, to further his own end. Some nights back we looked at the seven blessings couch in Revelation. But for everything God does, the devil has a counterfeit. Now, God has seven blessings. Satan has seven deception couch in Revelation to counteract the seven blessings. As a matter of fact, the seven times you see deception, it is yoked to Lucifer. Let's take some notes quickly. Revelation 12, 9. Let's go there quickly. If you won't read all of them, I'll just read a few. And you take note. Revelation 12, verse 9. Deception. Revelation 12, verse number 9. Are we there? Revelation 12, verse Number nine, are we there? And the Bible says, and the what? Thank you very much. And the great dragon, which was what? Keep on reading. Which what? Which deceiveth the what? The whole world. Second text, Revelation 13, verse 4. They're in order. Revelation 13, verse 4. The second time deception is mentioned in the, the Bible. 13, verse 4. We, we just read this one. And the Bible says, and he what? He says, and what? Deceive at them. That's it. Second deception. Let's look at Revelation 18, verse 23. Revelation 18, verse 23. His whole plan is deception. 18, verse 23. Are we there? And the Bible says, and what? Keep on reading. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall heard no more at, at, at all at thee. For the merchants 
Great men. Were what? All nations were what? Were deceived. We see it, right? The fourth one, Revelation 19, verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. 19, verse 20. All right, the Bible says, And the beast and the what? Was taken with them and the false prophet that wrought miracles before them, which with what? He what? He deceiveth. There it is again. Deception. And let's look at the sixth one now. Revelation 20, verse 3. Revelation 20, verse number 3. Deception, deception, deception. And the Bible says, 20, verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut up what? A seal upon it, that he should what? Deceive the nations no more. And the last one. Revelation, uh, the sixth one rather, 20, verse 8. 20, verse 8, in the same verse, it says, and the Bible says, And he shall go out and what? And deceive the nations. Right? And the last one is found in Revelation 20, verse number 10. Right? And the Bible says, And the who? That what? Deceiveth them, brethren. Seven blessings, seven deception. Now when Satan left heaven, we realize he took one third and they aid him in the grand work of fooling people. That is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, And no marvel that who? Satan himself is transformed into a what? Now, oftentimes we think, we think deception will take the form of black. And you know, everything bad is black. Black male, black cat, black Friday, all have mercy. But anyway, sometimes deception can take the form of light. As a matter of fact, when Satan came to Christ in the wilderness, Jesus did not know it was Satan. Inspiration says he came as an angel of light. It was when that rascal opened his mouth. And Christ said, I know that voice. I know that voice. Then we find this statement. From the Lord says, the power of Satan now to tempt and deceive is ten times greater than it was in the apostles. His power has increased and will increase until he is taken out of the way. He has sharpened his, his skills. And then Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians Verse 211, he says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. A Christian should not walk in ignorance. And we oftentimes say, What you don't know will hurt you. That's a lie. And will cost you. In 2 Thessalonians 2 9, we find this for even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power and signs and line what? Line wonders. The Bible says in verse number 10, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the what? Love of the truth, that they might be saved. That they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And the Bible says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion." That they all should believe a lie and be damned. So here we see Satan, God's give power, Satan power to work through the lamb-like beast to cause fire to come down from heaven to deceive those people. Now watch this now on Mount Carmel. Remember the scenario, right? With the Baal and, 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 and Elijah. Ba the prophets of Baal cried all night and day that Baal would light a what? Fire. Now, Ellen White says this. Watch it now. Prophets and Kings 150. Gladly would Satan have come to, the, to help those whom he had deceived and were devoted to his service. Gladly would he have sent a lightning to kindle the sacrifice. But Jehovah had set Satan's bound and restrained him. Then not one spark of fire could have been kindled. So he was restrained on Mount Carmel, but he's released in Revelation. Light the fire, Lucifer. Have it come down from heaven to deceive those people who have not the love of the truth. You know, some of us, we don't mind hearing truth now and then. Camp meeting and special occasion. But to hear it Sabbath after Sabbath, prayer meeting, no, sir. Watch it now. Satan has been studying the prophecies. Trust me. From Genesis to Revelation. Are you with me? Watch it now. I quote. I saw 
in vision that God has honest people among the fallen churches. And before the plague shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Transition, early writings to the one. Satan knows this. And before the loud cry, now where do you find a loud cry in the Bible? Revelation 18, that chapter. Of the third angel, he raises the excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for these churches. So Satan knows that God is going to bring a false true revival. So he goes before and create a counterfeit revival. And so the fire that he brings down from heaven is not some military power. It is a pseudo revival. Yeah, yeah. This thing is burn, burning all across North America. And Bermuda is not immune to this. We shall see in a moment. False revival. Time magazine recently featured a cover, The Most Influential Man in America. And we had uh, 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 Joyce Myers and Billy Graham and T.D. Jakes and uh, 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 um, what's this fella here? Uh, uh, God, my mind is slipping me tonight. Now. Help me, Holy Ghost. Purpose Driven, what's his name? Some of you read the book for evangelism. Shame on you. <laughs> Should have read it. Evangelism. Now, this counterfeit revival has three waves. How many waves? Now let me say this. Many Adventists have gotten on some of these waves and they can't swim. And this wave will lead them to the hot spot. You know, I was witness, witnessing to a man the other day in, 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 in Hamilton. And the man told me, he said, I don't want to go to heaven. I said, yeah. I said, why? He said, because all the pretty girls are going to be in hell. I started to laugh and I said, brother, you need professional help. <laughs> there will be no high fives in hell, brethren. Three waves this counterfeit revival has. The first wave, take note, the first wave refers to the Pentecostal movement, which is the typical speaking in tongues. Are you with me? This is the first wave of this false with my handkerchief. False. False revival. The first wave. This is what we call glossy, glossolalia. Are you with me? Watch it now. Now I'm going to show you something what constitutes this glossolalia. I have a clip. Is the mic on? Ella? Now watch this. I hope it's playing. It was a warm April day in the spring of 1906 when a group of African-American Christians gathered in a simple home on Bonnie Bray Street in downtown Los Angeles where they prayed and waited on God's Spirit. A pastor teacher named William Seymour was with them that night. The son of a slave who fought in the Civil War for the Union Army Seymour left his home in Louisiana at an early age and became a committed Christian after smallpox blinded him in one eye. 
the night of April 9th, Seymour met with a small gathering of people. He preached from the Bible, Acts 2, 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. A man named Edward S. Lee was baptized in the Spirit and began to speak in tongues. Soon after, a woman named Jenny Moore was also baptized in the Spirit. It seemed as if a vessel broke within me and water surged up through my being which, when it reached my mouth, came out in a torrent of speech and languages God had given me. Jenny Moore. What happened inside that house set on a hill separated fathers from sons and mothers from daughters. It invited ridicule from the press and divided congregations in Los Angeles and all over the United States. At the same time, it changed lives forever and forged friendships that crossed racial and economic barriers that endured until death. By the end of April, the Bible study on Bonnie Bray had grown so rapidly that it moved to new quarters on Azusa Street. Within a year, as many as 1,300 people crowded into the hall and gathered out on the dirt street to attend meetings. Upstairs, walls were full of crutches and canes left behind by those who had been healed. It spawned a dozen denominations and today, roughly 600 million people worldwide trace their spiritual roots to its dirt floors and plain wooden altar. History refers to what happened inside the whitewashed wood structure at 312 Azusa Street as the Azusa Street Revival. several of these clips. Now, in mercy, I purposely just extracted the ones that the young people. And this thing doesn't care whether you're black, white, blue, or Gentile. Even the whites have caught on to it now. I'm going to show you. does not discriminate. Now let me show you something now, brethren. I am not doubting the sincerity of these people. I am not. As a matter of fact, when I, I mean, I've been around the Adventist church all my life. Went to Advent Kingsway in Jamaica. Miss Mirage was my teacher. All my life I've been in this thing. Now, when I left the church, and the reason why I left because I played ball and the Sabbath and ball don't mix. But when I was playing ball, I had an auntie, good auntie. She was a holiness. And she always said to me, come back to church, man. Now, I knew that the seven days of Sabbath, even though I was in the world. And she kept on begging, so finally passed, just to appease her. I went to her church. So I came about, about 10-ish, drove in. When I got to the church, the man said to me, you can't go in the pew, you have to go in the tarrying corner. Serious tarrying corner. So when I went in tarrying corner, I'm sitting in tarrying corner like this now. I don't know what I'm tarrying for. But I'm sitting in tarrying corner. And then they start. They start to worship. And a lady came over to me. And she danced and she said, she said, touch him Jesus, touch him. And she danced and she said, touch him, touch him Jesus. 
And I'm sitting there, what did I get myself into now? A second guy came over in the towering corner. And he sat beside me. And she came over and she said, Touch him, Jesus, touch him. And the guy went like this. He started to jerk. And virgin, he started to foam. I took off. <laughs> Ain't no more towering there. You hear me? Took off, virgin. Those people experienced something that Sunday. You can't tell me. I was there. And I am not doubting their sincerity. I believe they are sincere Christians. And I have learned, as, as in my ministry, I have learned to separate the man from the message. So I'm not doubting it. And my auntie is a good Christian. And so we are, I'm not so much judging a person. I'm judging concepts and ideology. Now watch it now. If what we see on the screen and what I saw, if this is the true gift of tongues, we must seek for it quickly because we need it. But if it is not the Holy Spirit, then run from it quickly. Don't go near it. Are you with me? Now the first wave, look at it, the first wave, the first wave. Right? The first wave. Tongues. Tongues appears 143 times in the Bible. It really means dialectos in the, in, 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 in the Greek. Right? In the New Testament, rather. It means, what it means now? Dialectos. It means a language, a conversation, speech, discourse. That's what it means. Now, question. Question. My auntie always told me this. She said, you know, you Adventists are good people. But you don't fill it with the Spirit. I said, what do you mean, my Spirit? She said, you don't fill it with the Spirit. You haven't spoken in tongues. And she doubted my sincerity as a Christian because I have not spoken in tongues yet. Lord have mercy, this clock running like a water. No, question. At Pentecost, quickly, at Pentecost, did the apostles speak in language or unknown tongues? Let's go to Acts 2 quickly, quickly, quickly. This is the first wave. We got two more waves left. Acts 2. Acts 2, verse number 5. Now we know Pentecost. Three times a year, all Jews had to come to Jerusalem. Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. Are you with me? Now watch it now. Acts 2, verse 5 through 11. I'm going to read quickly and listen quickly. Right? Acts 2. And the Bible says this, right? Look at verse number 5. And the Bible says, They were dwelling at Jerusalem. Are we there? Jews, devoted men, out of every nation. Under what? So the Jews had been scattered. Right? Verse 6. Now, when this noise was abroad, a multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own what? Language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these Jews speak Galileans? Verse 8, And how hear every man in his own tongue? Dialectos, language, where we were born. Parthians, Mede, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia. And he lists a whole bunch of them. The Bible says in verse 11 now, Crees and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues, these wonderful words. So that which they spoke was something intelligent. Watch it now. Inspiration says this. They were dwelling, as the apostles, Jews, devoted men. During the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered almost every part of the inhabited world. In their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on occasion to Jerusalem attending the religious festivals in progress. Every known tongue was represented by the assembly. With, watch it now. Then she says this. The diversity of languages now would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a what? Miraculous manner, supplied the what? The fishing of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did for them which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. That's crucial. Underscore lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy languages of those to whom they were laboring for. Now let me say this. When you read the book of Acts, don't read it as a historical book. Read it as a future book. 
Because that what happened then is going to happen again. So read the book of Acts as what God's going to do for you in the future. Now let me show you something. India alone, and this is just a snippet of what I wish I could tarry here all night. India has over 16 different languages and 1,600 dialects. And these are all people, children, for whom Jesus died. They must hear the three angels' message. And as God had a vehicle then, he's going to have a vehicle today. Are you with me? Now, some of us, well, I speak English. I haven't even mastered English yet. I break all kind of verbs. Have mercy. I don't even have time to learn it fully. We don't have time to learn anything else. So therefore, under the, in the final clauses now, what God did on Pentecost, he's going to do if you receive a lot of rain. Now bear in mind, in Jerusalem there were 2 to 3 million Jews and only 120 received the early rain. Indonesia, 840 different languages. They must hear the gospel. So here we see, God must use the gift of tongues as he used then. Afghanistan, 53 different languages. It's so bad, you cross one line a different language in. They must hear the gospel. As God used tongues then, he's going to use things now. Now, Christian, now, does the Bible teach that every born-again Christian receives the gift of tongues? Go to 1 Corinthians quickly. 1 Corinthians 4.11. Does the Bible teach that every born-again Christian receives the gift of tongues? 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 11. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 11. 1 Corinthians 12. Good to hear those pages turning. Hallelujah. Right? Now we won't read the whole thing, but look at it now. You read it when you get home. Verse 10. All right? It, all different gifts that God gives to the church. But look at verse number. Some has the gift. Verse 9, the gift of healing. Right? Gift of faith in verse 9. Look at verse 10. To another, the working of what? Another what? And what else? During of spirit and another diverse kinds of tongues, another interpretation of tongues. So to say that every born again Christian must speak in tongues is not true. No question. Was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Was he? Of course, from the crown of his head to his big toe, he was filled. Are you with me? The Bible says it in Mark 1. When he came out of the water, the Spirit came upon him. Now, did Jesus speak in tongues? Did he? No, talk to me Adventist. Come on now. He didn't speak in tongues. I wonder why. You know why? The answer says this. Because he came unto his own and his own received him not. He didn't have to. As a matter of fact, Jesus traveled no more than a hundred miles. He had to speak in tongues. They all spoke the same language. So therefore, in a congregation where the same language is the same, then the gift of tongues is not needed. Does it edify a congregation, right? To listen to a language such as Latin if nobody understands Latin. No. Write a text down, 1 Corinthians 14, 42, 7. So, as God's people, we have an intelligent concept of tongues. Adventists, I hope, won't be deceived by this wave. But then there's a second wave. And many have jumped on board on this wave. Watch it now. The second wave is this. It is called the charismatic movement. And the neo underscore, neo underscore, neo Pentecostalism. You know what neo means? Neo means a new order. It differs from the traditional Pentecostalism. What makes it different? Here it is. The second wave is a bridge between more traditional Pentecostalism of the first wave and those who become part of the second. You see, the first wave teaches you have to be a Pentecostal to experience Pentecostalism. But the second wave teaches you can be a Catholic, remain in your church and still experience Pentecostalism. This is the second wave. You don't have to leave your church. 
Stay in your church and just implement the same methods. Watch it now. Key leaders among the Neo Pentecostals have been Oral Roberts, mid 80s, Dennis uh, Pat Robinson, David Duplis, Tam and Jimmy Baker, and so forth. These were key leaders, the movers and the shakers in the Pentecostal movement. No. I'm going to give you some tenets. And judge for yourself because you are intelligent people to see if strange fire is burning in God's true church. And if it is, we need the fire truck. You hear me? Line them up, pastor. We're going to put it out. Are you with me? The first tenant of the neo-Pentecostal movement is this. Take notes. One, minimal use of denominational hymnal. And we're going to use it, but minimally. Minimal use. Now, Bridget, we must keep our balance now. Am I saying you have to sing the hymns only? No. No. Because God is still inspiring people to write songs. We must keep a healthy balance now. But Bridget, I'm telling you, in a time of trouble, I need some hymn in my head. As a matter of fact, I was called to perform an exorcism. And I'm telling you, as I went in the house, I had a Caucasian body. He drew off a power in the blood. And the demon squealed. And so what happens now, people don't, are not encouraged. And this is not, this is rocking, this is dividing every church in Christianity. So people are discouraged now from bringing hymnals to church. You don't need those stuff. Sir. Just come, come with your two long hands. Praise him. And what happens now, sometimes they sing these mantras. Yes, hey, you don't want to miss Saturday evening. Because I'm going to talk about hypnosis and acupuncture. Oh yes, come early. Please, and bring a friend. Or bring an enemy, bring somebody. Right? So you have these mantras, 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 mantras is like self-hypnosis. That is why Jesus says, when you pray, avoid repetition as the heathens do. And now some churches, one hook lasts about half an hour. Now we must have choruses, don't get me wrong now. One, hey, I was called to preach at a youth day, and I'm not lying to you. They sang a mantra for about half an hour and they gave me 10 minutes to preach. And in this new movement, music is the high point of the worship. The high point. Very little word. And music was never used to convert anybody in the Bible. Music ushers you in the presence of God. Tenants of the third, second wave. Watch it now. It gets even worse. Brother Scott, start the car for me. <laughs> Watch it now. Tenants, dance theater. Singing tongues and hula hoops. I'm telling you. It's like you go into a, some go-go show. I'm telling you, Bridget. And they're usually dressed in spandex. And then we have this sign in. Now, Virgin, if people are hearing impaired, we need a sign up. But listen, I am not deaf. Neither is God. We don't need to be signing. You sign into Virgin. Come on, Virgin. It is the second wave. Tenants of the second wave. And you have conservative, even Baptist church are being divided by this. Are you with me? Are being divided. No. There are some who say, but preacher. Come on now. Didn't David dance? He did dance. David also committed adultery. Yeah. And he committed murder. No. You read the text, 2 Samuel 6, 6, 14. No, look at this statement now from prophets and kings. Mrs. White is now magnifying this text. She says this. 
David dancing in reverent joy before God has been cited by pleasure lovers in justification of the fashionable modern dance. Hey, I've seen people doing the doing the, the, the bogle in church. I'm not lying to you. And doing the running man and say, but David dance. At my own eyes. But there is no ground for such an argument. In our day, dancing is associated with folly and midnight reveling. Health and morals are sand sacrificed by pleasure. The music and dancing in joyful praise to God at the removal of the ark had not the faintest resemblance of the dissipation of the modern dance. The one tend to the remembrance of God. Read it when you go home. So we can't use David dance to justify this lewdness. And there are two things you must never forget about Seventh-day Adventism. One, it has its purity. It's a pure faith, brethren. It has its preservation. You know why God preserved his church? Our pioneers, they stuck to the book. And they stuck to the standards. You stick to the book. And I know it's not popular to take a stand. And if I take a stand, then I lose people. But better lose people than lose God. Watch it now. In mercy, I'm just giving you a sample. Jumping in the house of God. The guy said, we don't preach long sermons. More articles. Scum of the earth, outreach touches church outcast in Denver. It says, uh, uh, the article says, one young, one young lady now who caught it, the second wave, she's saying, I have discovered a totally new way of worship God. 19, a member of the youth group from Zion Mennonite Church. And Mennonites were usually conservative people. Right? It's amazing how the music can be so loud. Yet I can hear God so clearly. Are you ready to dance? Scream, John Carlson, 18, tonight, immerse in the worship leader. Get ready to celebrate. Get ready to praise God because he deserves it. Praise God. Praise in his place. Testify of his goodness. The beat picks up again. The DJ spins a slamming, progressive, hot, heart pump pumping Christian lyrics. I have heard, to exp I can't read it, but it's bad. And I wonder if this fire is burning amongst us. Yeah. Let me tell you something. You see, this is how Satan is slick. We wouldn't let anybody preach in our church. And rightly so, pass out the governor the flock. Check the man theology. But we let any music play. When I was growing up, and I, tomorrow's my birthday, bake me a cake. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So I'm, and I'm, I'm 33 tomorrow, so I'm not some, some far move. When I was growing up in, in, in church in Florida, Jamaica, you had to submit that music by Wednesday night latest. You didn't just come on Sabbath, oh, the Lord inspired me. No, he didn't. We need to hear what you're going to sing and what kind of track. And they would scream it, scan it. But today, come on in, praise him, brother. Praise him. That's all, that's all we have gone, brethren. Musicians were paid in the sanctuary when some love offering collected. They were paid in the sanctuary because they understood. And bear in mind, you see, your theology dictates your song. And let me just warn you, young people. Some of you have good songs. Keep on singing for Jesus. Good voices. But you have to check the words you see, sometimes they are good Christians. You see, for instance, if you believe the soul is immortal, you're going to write about it. I was at a concert, one of our mega churches, and a young girl, she could blow. And she got up and she said, this one is for Mah Mahela Jackson. She pointed up. I don't know why, because Mahela Jackson is down. <laughs> and I leaned over. And she said, play the track. And the guy said, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, way up. In Jerusalem, when I die, I'm going to walk in Jerusalem, talk in Jerusalem. No, we don't go to Jerusalem, we die, we go to the grave. And sometimes what happens, we don't look at the words of the song. The hymn 
moves us and the rhythm moves us. I'm not saying God doesn't inspire people out there, but you have to check the words by the Bible. Because their theology, their doctrine is couched in these songs. If they don't believe in victory over sin, they're going to sing, We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. Don't we say no one is able to keep you from falling? Some of you are going to have to stop falling down. But if you don't believe in victory over sin, you're going to believe you're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. And we will not be sinning when Jesus comes. We'll be sinful. It's a big difference. This will be held in check by the Holy Spirit. Check your songs, Virgin. Check your songs. And then there is that emotional excitement. And I find some of these people there as empty as a barrel. They don't no one text to prove what they believe. You back them up in, in, in marketplace, they call everybody. Call Pastor Ella, and they can't prove what they believe. I know what I'm talking about. And it's a true saying, empty barrel still make the most noise. Watch it now. Lord have mercy, stop the clock. She says, the thing you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown will take place just before the what? Notice, she didn't say before the coming of Jesus. Now, Bridget, this is Adventist theology now. We know that probation closed long before Jesus comes. As a matter of fact, there are seven last plagues that must fall. And the Bible says her plagues shall fall in one day. And some have reduced the plague day for a year. May have one year with a plague. And there are some who say, well, time shall be no longer. So there's two different camps. But all I'm saying is, Bridget, if you don't pass probation, forget the coming of Christ. That's way down in the future. You must survive this. So look at the take back up now. Before the close of probation, every uncool thing will be demonstrated. They'll be shouting with drums and music and dancing. Let me stop there now, because we don't want to be fanatical now. I don't believe that the piano is a bigger city than the drum. It's quiet on me. Let me say it again. I don't believe that the piano is a bigger sinner than the guitar. You see, it is not the instrument sometimes. It's the man behind the instrument. These things will gather dust if nobody touch it. Are you with me? So if you have an unconverted man behind an instrument, you can get an unconverted sound. If the man is converted, then the instrument will give a converted sound. And she says, we should not condemn the use of instrument in our service. Don't make atheists out of them. You ever, you ever been to an orchestra? Everything is blended, skillfully played. The drum not leaving the piano, the piano hold on. Now bear in mind now, there were only stringed instruments used in the sanctuary. So you missed that one. But we have to be balanced, Virgin. Are you with me? She says, you read it when you get home. Read the whole text, Selective Messages, Book 2, page. So she says, this is, this is not the Holy Spirit, she says. She says, don't even bring it in. Confusion, she says. Just before the close of probation. I wonder if the third, second wave is in our church. Judge for yourself. We're intelligent people. The Adventist church is the most educated church in the world. We have more degrees than a dentist in this place. I have done the research. You have more bachelor's, associate's, PhD, and some congregations. We, are, we can think and reason. Let me hasten. In Daniel 3, 5, just before the image was put up, all kind of music. Read it. Then the image, they were called to bow down. The old folks got up to get down. And those who had arthritis got down. The Bible says only three, Shadrach, Meshach, and someone said a bad Negro. Only three, but the music precedes the image. Lord, the clock, Lord have mercy. <laughs> then there is that doctrines are de-emphasized. If you preach doctrine, you're hard. You're unchristlike. You are dubbed fanatical. So they de-emphasize doctrine, and then now, then they just love is this chief emphasis of Christ. Just talk about the blood. But why was the blood shed? 
Because of sin. Then what is sin? The breaking of God's law. You can't de-emphasize doctrine. Doctrines are de-emphasizing this kind of worship. And some of our, I've been, I've been to one campaign. I don't know why I went. I felt so bad. I was a Bible worker, one of the lead Bible workers. The man campaign was, God got it. God got it. Monday, you want a car? God got it. You want a wife? God got it. God got it. God got it. God got it. That's all he preached. That's one doctrine. God got it was a theme. That's it. God got it. God got it. God got it. No doctrine. Then the tenant is the Bible is interpreted in a manner pleasing to unrenewed hearts. Don't touch the vital truth. And I believe many of our churches we have gotten on this wave. And half of them can't swim and there's no lifeguard out there. Then emphasis is placed on mega church. I read an article. A certain church got the award for being the first mega church in Adventism that is not linked to a school. You know what John Wesley said? He said this in his biography. The bigger the church gets is the less religion you find. End quote. Mega church deception. Mega and giga. Giga. Mrs. White said this. The formation of small companies as a basis for Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. And when you have, you have social loafing in these churches, he's going to do it. He says, she's going to do it. And she says, and it never gets done. Then you got the, the final wave. The most dangerous wave of it all. The signs and wonder wave movement. Watch it now. The third wave. In the 1980s, the Vineyard Christian Fellowship Movement began with the ministry of John Weinberg in California. He believed that people would become convinced of the genuineness of Christianity, seeing miraculous signs and wonders from God, than being convinced doctrinally. So a paradigm shift took place now. See it, you're going to believe it. He not only practiced this belief in his church he pastored, but he teamed up with missionary professors Peter Wagner at Fuller, Fuller Theological Seminary. I wouldn't trust a man with a hundred foot pole who went to Fuller. You mix with dog, you get fleas. And the Bible says, by beholding, you become changed. Is it wrong for a Christian to ask for a sign or a wonder? Is it wrong? Moses asked for a sign, didn't he? What was his sign? He put his hand in his bosom, leprosy. Put it back in, clean. Gideon asked for a sign. The feast was wet inside, next time outside. Charles Spurgeon said, Let us remember that signs have been given and have not wrought fate in those who have seen them. There is no necessary in connection between seeing a sign and believing in God. Signs are wonder. You need to ask for a sign if God has spoken. Don't ask for a sign to marry that Moabite. Because the Bible says, be not unequally yoked, you will get no sign, Bridget. Don't ask for a sign, Lord, should I keep the seventh day Sabbath? I heard a story told, a woman came to a camping and, and she, she saw it, God's seventh day Sabbath. She said, Lord, if you want me to keep the Sabbath tomorrow, let the sun shine. It rained cats and dogs. The preacher said she didn't realize a faithful Sabbath tied pain farmer prayed for rain. <laughs> and God heard his prayer than hers. If God has spoken, you ain't gonna get no sign. Pharaoh, God sent ten plagues. You know why he sent ten plagues? They were polytheistic. They worshiped the crocodile, the ants, everything they worship. Ten plagues. Israel was monotheistic. Hero Israel. The Lord God is one. And after God sent ten plagues, you know what Pharaoh said? 
Who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice. Fine. God gave them water out of a rock. 40 years, their shoe. This is three months old. I want you to start to lean. Six months and it has hole already. 40 years, God preserved them. He fed them manna. And the Bible says they perished in the wilderness because of unbelief. Who were the catalysts behind this sign and wonder movement as I close? Owell Roberts in the 40s and 50s. Millions of people of all faiths come to this great tent to be saved, healed, and witness to what faith in God can do. Some of the things you're about to see, some of the healings, may seem strange if you have not been reading your Bible. For Christ has commanded us to preach and to heal. So to assure you that you're seeing these things as they actually happened, I have put this assurance in the form of a legal affidavit. A copy of this affidavit, duly signed, notarized, and certified, has been placed on file in the Florence County Courthouse, Florence, South Carolina. And now, I invite you into the Great Tent Cathedral for one of the four services filmed in Florence. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my happy privilege and pleasure to present the man that God has raised up with a message for your deliverance. God's man for this hour, the Reverend Oral Roberts. Now, I'd like to invite you to join me tonight with your prayers and faith as I start offering prayer to God for the healing of the sick. People are here from all over America, from many states in this nation. Many of them have been given up to die. And this, in some instances, is their last resort. There is no conflict between medical science and healing by faith in God, because all are striving for the same end. And it is not I who heals, it's God. When someone in this line is healed, it's God's power that does it. And I want you to join me. Open your heart. Have faith in God. In a few minutes, I'm going to reach out my hand and pray for you right there. I know God's able to heal you. All you friends here in the audience, join me tonight. Open your hearts to God. He's able to reach out and heal you there in your chair. If you believe it, say amen. amen. All right, Brother Deweese, I'm ready. Tell me your name, please. What? Guy Griffith. Guy Griffith? Yeah. Where are you from, Guy? Burley, West Virginia. Is this your first campaign to be in, Guy? No, I was in no And you have come here that you might be fully and completely delivered from epilepsy. Yeah. Have you faith in God, Guy? Yeah. Are you living a life for God? Yeah. You are definitely saved by his power. I'm saved under your ministry. Well, if you're oh, saved under my ministry, I know you're saved. <laughs> Audience, bow your heads a moment. Thou tormentors that bind him, I adjure you by Christ, come out of this boy, loose him, enter into him no more as long as he lives. Audience, raise your heads a minute. Guy, those things have really been powerful in you, haven't they? Yes, I had one time in life. Was it bad? The Lord told me that I would be healed after it. After this last convulsion, which you had Sunday night, the Lord told you you would be healed told after me. it. All right, audience, one more time. Oh, God, grant me this miracle according to thy will in heaven by the power of the name of Christ. Heal him! They're coming out. They're coming out now. Heal him! God, they're out of there. Thank you, God. Forbid them ever to come back in the name of Christ. <laughs> God, how do you feel now? I feel good. Oh, that's what I'm God. <laughs> you think you'll never have another convulsion? Oh, I'll never have another. Why? Oh, it's gone. It's gone in Jesus' yeah. name. That's the power of God, guy. God bless you and go with you now. Yes, we're so glad you're here tonight.
What did you say? Pathologists all over the country have studied my case. There are only 30 some odd cases of this disease recorded. Only 35 cases 30 of this disease some odd recorded, recorded in the nation? In medicine. In, in medicine. medicine. In the whole world. It destroys the fatty tissue and leaves scars on the body. Mrs. Turner, are you the wife of one of our pastors here on the platform? Yes. Brother Turner, is, is what your wife said true? Very true. Very true. Do you believe that the Lord will help her tonight? I know the Lord can heal. You know he can? Yes, I do. On what do you base that, Brother Turner? Well, if God can save you, God can heal you. And I've seen too many evidences of his healing already here in this campaign. Amen. I'm going to touch you as a point of contact. And when I touch you, I expect to turn my faith loose. And I want you to turn your faith loose. You will. Oh, God, I come to thee for Mrs. Turner tonight for the healing of this very rare disease. I ask for a healing miracle now that she be healed. From the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Mrs. Turner, in the name of Christ, be healed. Be made whole. People, raise your hand. The audience, get your healing right now. Be healed. People, hold on with me. Don't give up tonight. I held on so long there? No, I don't. I wanted to feel contact with God. I wanted to have the feeling assurance in my heart. And I know that I felt his power. Have you felt his anointing yet? I certainly have. You did when yes, I prayed. I In what way? A strange, glorious feeling came over my body. People, you can get healed in this audience right now. There's a different atmosphere here now than there was a few minutes ago. Praise God. Master, may Mrs. Turner be fully recovered and miraculously healed that it shall never return. In Christ's name, may I shake your hand and wish you Godspeed. And you, Holmes, wish you Godspeed tonight. You're so very welcome. All right. Now you've got polio from your waist down and the right side is affected the most. Are you the mother? Step over here a minute and talk to me. Tell me when this happened to Billy Ray. Last July. And where do you folks live? Lake City, South Carolina. And your name is what? Omni Osborne. Well, tell me why you brought Billy Ray to our campaign. To be healed. Mrs. Poston? Yes. Do you sincerely believe that Christ can heal your child? Yes, sir. Why do you think that? Well, I do, because he said he, he said he would heal the afflicted. Yes. Billy Ray, do you have faith in the Lord? Yes, sir. You think God can heal you? Yes, sir. Well, I believe he can. Will you join me now as I pray for this young man tonight? Oh, God, let thy healing go into his hip and limbs. Let the healing virtue of Christ heal him. Brother Deweese, I want him on my knee just one minute. Son, he's going to lift you up here. Brother Deweese, are you ready for this? Pastors, the sponsors and churches, are you praying with me tonight? Audience in the tent, you friends there. Now, Jesus, we ask that his little lambs be healed and that they shall be restored. Restore them tonight in the name of Christ the Lord. Oh, God, loosen that little foot up. <laughs> Take the stiffness. Oh, it's coming now, son. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, God. Now then, Billy Ray, 
I want you to raise that leg up like that. Oh, you can do it! Raise this one up, son. Now raise this little leg up, son. Oh, that's wonderful tonight. Jesus of Nazareth, let that virtue of healing go into this limb once more, into his little right foot particularly. Heal by that power and make him whole. What do you say? This. What do you think, hon? Because I, my leg is straightening. I couldn't get it straight. But you? I can set up like that. It, 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 it is straightening? Hurt. How can you tell it's straightening? Because I couldn't lift my leg up like you that. You couldn't lift it up? Oh, oh, that's wonderful. Brother Dewey's, we're going to put him down now. Honey. Oh, he wants down. Honey, walk on off, son. Walk on. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> no, Owen Roberts impacted a woman named. Catherine Kuhlman, we're going to talk about her Saturday evening. Catherine Kuhlman was, 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 a, was a prodigy, or Oral Roberts mentored her. This life shall be set apart. These things do not happen. They do not just happen. This is all in the part of the plan of God. We thank you, Jesus. Go on down and give God all the praise. What is this? Two years ago, she had club feet. She's had club feet all of her life. You've just had a goiter to dissolve? She was in How long have you had your goiter? All this summer, and it's just worried me. <laughs> and, and, and is she related to you? She's my daughter. She's 12. And she was here to what? Club feet, severe club feet. Where? Two years ago at the Civic Center. We went to the hospital at Shreveport. When we were here in Tulsa two years ago? Shreveport, Louisiana. We went back there and the doctor said she had two bones added to each foot. He didn't know how they got there from the operation. But here in Tulsa. The x-ray showed two extra bones added to her feet. <laughs> but he didn't understand how the bones were added to the feet. She had no more pain. No more and pain. And she had club feet? Severe club feet, and now she born. Was she was born with the club feet. Severe. They said she, her feet were turned completely up and hardened. So sometime during the service, when we were here two years ago, she was healed. And you went back to the doctor, and the doctor said two more bones, bones were added to her feet two years ago. I can prove to you that I have nothing to do with these miracles. This is the first time I've known about this. This is God. Walk across there, honey. And you mean, and her feet are just perfect. And, and she was... Now, today. <laughs> Dear Jesus, every trace of this goiter goes. Go on, go on and give God all the praise. There's so much is happening over here. You know, what is this over here? Bend over right now. Just bend completely over. The power of the Holy Ghost just goes through this body. We give you praise. <laughs> Somebody is, I know the glory that's on this woman. There's so much is happening. I'm not getting oh. everything. Somebody's I, getting sight in an eye. I don't know oh where you are. Brother, I just had a request. There, there, my brother, <laughs> there is somebody that's oh. getting a, the sight in an eye. She then mentioned this fellow called Benny Hinn. And they are all in white. You know why? We're going to talk about Saturday evening. Oh, yes. She meant toward Benny Hinn. And Benny Hinn has a demon. No, back up. He has several demons. He mimics Catherine Kuhlman. I wonder why. And he says he goes to her graveyard and she communicates to him in California. I have it on clip. I'm going to show you. Saturday evening. Signs and wonder. You know, when Jesus healed a person in the Bible... They never lost consciousness.
to Joshua, he said, when you shout, the walls will come tumbling down. Because God goes up with a shout, that's what's coming tonight! And ne Never lost consciousness. And this thing is taking every church signs and wonder. People are throwing away the Bible. Give me a sign. Give me a miracle. No, Virgin, we should not disparage miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe that God put tax money in a fish mouth and let the fish come to Peter's hook. I believe in miracles. I believe he healed blind Bartimaeus and he rose Lazarus from the dead. I believe in miracles. But if I ever saw a miracle or a miracle worker contradict the word of God, then let the miracle worker be damned. Holy Spirit, the Catholic, even the Catholics, and they were the, the most conservative people. They have gotten on the wave. Healing, this priest, healing. Rise and walk. And when Jesus heals somebody, he always say, go sin no more. You know why? You see, if, you see, sometimes you may have diabetes. If Christ was to heal you and say, don't cut down the sugar, he'll be sanctioning sin. More signs and wonder. Fire burning. Moses said this in, read, write the text down. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3. The text says this. The truths of the Bible are of greater importance than a miracle performed in your sight. Any day. Any day. Watch as I wind up. Watch it now. We are told the Bible will never be superseded by miraculous manifestation. Never. The truth must be studied. It must be searched out as hidden treasures. Wonderful illuminations will not be given aside from the word of God or take its place. Watch it now. Give me one second. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet ever lived, Jesus said. And John did not work. No miracle. And we are a type of John the Baptist. Why aren't we working miracles? This is the reason. Write it down. Selective message book two. She says, the way in which Christ worked was to preach the word, to relieve suffering by miraculous work of healing. But I am instructed that we cannot now work in this way. Miracles will accompany the ministry of God's people under the Lord cry. But if they will not, ha but they will not have the significance they did in Christ's days. The performing of miracles will no longer be a proof of divine endorsement. So you can't say I will not join Southampton Church because pastor ain't healing anybody. That's not the acid test. Is he preaching the truth? For Satan will exercise power. He can work miracles. And you know why he can heal people? Because he brought diseases. God's people will find, will not find their safety in working miracles. For Satan will counteract the miracles which we have wrought. No question. Fire is burning. How can you tell the journey and the false? It looks like the same. How can you tell? This is it now. Watch it now. So closely with the counterfeit. Resembles the true. It will be impossible to tell except by the Holy Scriptures. You got to test it by the word, Bridget. Amen. Secondly, Laodicea is blind. We are blind. So you have to have your eyes anointed. With what? With eye saw. What is the eye saw? I saw a famous school of medicine grew up in connection with the temple. And here the powder, Phrygian eye powder, was, was, was developed in Laodicea. Watch it now. Figure, I have in his commentary. Figuratively, the eye saw here offered to the Laodiceans in, is heaven's antidote for their spiritual blindness. So it helps us to see. Watch it now. I saw, this eye saw may also be thought to represent spiritual grace, which enables the Christian to distinguish between the true and error, between right and wrong. Our eyes has got to be anointed, Benjamin. You got to have the word Amen. and beg for eye salve. Pray for it. Now the fire is burning in God's church. And it is burning. 
Some churches burn it down. Now how would God put out this fire? How will God put out this fire? Back to my intro. There are two ways you can fight fire. I'm closing now. Two ways. One, you fight fire with water. Yeah. But then, the fireman says, there's a thing called control burning. Watch it now. What is control burning? Is the process by which a strip of fire is started on the leeward side so that when the fire reaches the burn area, it can go no further. So while Satan has his force rather coming this way, God's going to light a fire here to burn that way. So when that comes, it can go no further. And this is what revival is all about. God wants to light a fire in our hearts, in our homes. Beloved, it is coming. Here it is as I close. Before the final visitation upon the earth, there will be among the people of God a revival of primitive godliness that has not been witnessed since the apostolic time. God's going to light a fire to burn out that neo-Pentecostalism with the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all kind of ways. And Jesus wants to light that fire in your heart. You know where he want to start? 80% of all fires start in the home. That's it. It starts at the altar bedroom. These meetings come to an end next week. Then what? Then what? You're going to stop? Light your fire. Keep it burning. So you can stand to the last great delusion. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father in heaven. Lord, we're so thankful for the war in the apocalypse. We're so thankful that tonight we see clearly how Satan is working. Now, Father, we pray that you'll keep us from this strange fire. Oh, Lord, we want the true fire to burn within our hearts, in our homes, on our jobs. We want people to see Christ in us and come to glorify Christ. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for how he has worked throughout this week. A lot was said this week, but Father, we pray that no human birds will come and steal it, God. Seal these things for eternity. As we leave from this place and go to our respectable homes, may we find them in the same manner we left them. Bless this church. Bless Pastor Gibbons. Bless his wife. Bless the elders. Bless this conference. Preserve us blameless until you come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. amen.